Can you hear me? Can you hear me down the back? Is it coming through? Banakli la el father gar glair. Blessings of St. Patrick's Day upon you all. Um, thanks very much for having me back at Calvary. I think this is the third year that I've been here. The first was virtually, and then last year I was here in this very pulpit, and I'm here again this year. So thank you very much to everybody involved in Calvary, and congratulations on 100 years of this Lenten series. Um, Lent is my favorite time of the church calendar. Um, I don't know why. Maybe it's the kind of mild moroseness of... Um, <laughs> of Irishness, I'm not sure, but I do like it. Lent, of course, coming from the Latin word for spring. So with great patience, Paul has just read out um, the entirety of the first poem about creation. Um, that's the Everett Fox translation. Um, Everett Fox is a contemporary translator of Hebrew Bible into English, and he has the Torah translated, which is really magnificent. And what he does is he translates in such a way where you can hear the dynamism of Hebrew rendered into English. And so he isn't trying to write in such a way that um, makes the English feel um, very recognizable. He's trying to make the English feel a little bit um, unrecognizable so that you can recognize that this text was written in a different language. It's magnificent. Creeping things that creep upon the earth, crawling things that crawl... Um, upon the earth too, flying things that fly in the sky, seated things that sit in the seats. <laughs> so let's um, first of all take some time to praise the language. Wild and waste we hear in the first sentence, and rushing spirit of God hovering over the face of the waters. How amazing, how beautiful. God said there was, and setting and dawning, you can hear these repeated refrains. And then there's these seven days. The first day, Light and darkness are separated, and then we hear that phrase, for the first time it was good. The second day, sky and water separated. The third day, sea and land separated. And then it's the first sprouting forth we hear. Let the earth sprout forth with sprouting forth, seeds after their own kind. It was good. And then the fourth day, we hear lights in heavens, the sun and the moon. And then the fifth day, let the waters swarm with a swarm of living beings, and the air swarm with a swarm of flying beings, and the earth crawl with crawling things, and then make all the baby crawling things. That's an instruction that happens at this stage on day five. And then day six, other animals, us included, humankind, in the image of God, God created this earth animal, and again, make all the baby human beings. It was very good. That's the sixth day. And the seventh day, God finished, God ceased from the work that God had made. So it's a poem of delight, it's a poem of um, enjoyment of language, um, and it's also a poem of patterns. You know, the first pattern that you can hear perhaps is seven days, and we hear the mathematical intuition of those early poets to discern this um, particularity of the number seven that is relevant to the question of um, the, the, the circling of the earth that's relevant to the question about who are we in the great planet and the great heavens of things. And then there's these repeated refrains, and I'm only going to mention four. God said, and there was, this interest in language, of course. And then the second, separating things. And then the third, it was good. You hear that refrain moderated then in the sixth day. It was very good. And then the fourth refrain, after their kind. This after their kind, that after their kind. It's thought in linguistics that what we needed before we needed particulars of, of grammar was that we needed categories, because we needed some grunt, some noise, some something to be able to say danger. And that might be that red berry, or fire, or cliff, or path. And so we needed something of categories in order to be able to indicate things that ha look nothing alike, but they are a category together. And what we hear here is a, a profound intelligence about categories. And in this poem of, uh, how old is it? Uh, four and a half thousand years old, this poem perhaps. Um, we hear this poem with a profound intelligence and interest about categories. How is it that we can understand categories? And in that, this is the extraordinary intelligence, one of the extraordinary intelligences of the poem. Stepping away from the content of the poem, I'm curious about who wrote it, <laughs> who decided, do you know what I'm going to do today? I'm going to put words into the mouth of God. Who decided that? What an extraordinary thing to do. Um, and I want to take a little moment to praise the person, the first person who thought, here's what this is, on the first day. 
and they began to put it out there. Who decided that? Is it audacious, do you know? Did they think they were God? <laughs> were they desperate? Or were they in need? I think it's something deeper than that. I don't think it was audacity. I think it was the impulse of art. And I want to think about what it was that the poets behind this text, this text evolved, of course, written by numbers of people. What did those poets mean when they put their artistic intelligence to language? And there's a French writer, Paul Valéry, and he wrote poetry and prose and aphorisms. And he has one extraordinary aphorism, which from the moment I heard it, I have remembered it. I'll say it in French, and then I'll give a couple of translations into English. Here's the aphorism. Dieu a fait tout de rien, mais le rien perce. God made everything out of nothing. But the nothingness persists. You can also put that final verb, perce, into different ways. Pierces, persists, penetrates. God made everything from nothing. But the nothingness shows through, is how somebody else put it. And so in this landscape of the poem, there's sky and land and animals and there's air and birds and water and weather and growing things and flying things and swimming things and creeping things and baby-making things. People saw themselves and their consciousness and their consciousness of their consciousness, which is unusual and unique in this particular area. And then they began to ask these questions. What is this? What is the order of this? Where did language come from? What about fire? What about water? Who put these things in the heavens? What are these lights to rule by night and day? And what about the storm over the water? What's that? And what am I a part of? They began to ask themselves these extraordinary questions. And in the face of that, one of their first impulses was to look for a certain kind of order. Categories and genus and species, we might call that these days, and language and predictability and rhythm and equality and ecosystem. And they also tried to make a container for time, day and night and seven days. Fascinating. These are um, intuitions toward what we would now call physics, present here in this magnificent poem. And in the face of eternity, they asserted shapes, shapes to hold a day, shapes to hold a night, shapes to hold what we'd now call a week. And it's looking for an ecosystem of things. It's a glorious mess of all kinds of things together, together, together. And they're not looking to kind of lay it out in delineated ways, but they're looking to see what is the intuitive indigenous order of everything. And in the middle of that, in fact, not even at the middle, at the beginning of that, they asserted something of the nothing. Because it all begins at the beginning of God's creating of the heavens and the earth, when the earth was wild and waste. This translation here, wild and waste, comes from Hebrew, tohu vavohu, is what that is in Hebrew. Nobody knows what tohu vavohu means. It just means higgledy-piggledy. In Irish, you'd say, <laughs> re rogs rulabula. In English, you can say, pell-mell, or hither and thither. The Irish linguist, Michal O'Shiel, has done, and he's a poet as well, extraordinary poet, he's done a deep exploration of many of the world's languages and looks at how it is that when people are talking about chaos, they use some word that has order, pell-mell, higgledy-piggledy, re rogus rula bula tohu vavohu in the original. It doesn't mean anything. It's just meant to indicate something that you can't contain, but you try to contain with some language. I heard once somebody said, that doesn't make any sense at all. They said, all tohu vavohu means is icky icky. You went, well, you've just done the same thing. <laughs> A little bit of order to face the chaos. And this is one of the primal things that's behind art. I think is that tension between order and chaos. And how is it that we hold it together? God made everything out of nothing, but the nothingness penetrates. And in this nothingness, in the presence of seven days facing nothing, of time facing eternity, of a single moment facing into what we know is dark matter, in the presence of this, perhaps all we have is art to look at us and to look back at us. We're saying that language is a sign and an engagement with what we do not understand. We try to understand, but language will always come up against its limitations. And we always know what the welter in the waste, the tohu, the vavohu is. And art exists in this fundamental conflict that we experience. 
and perhaps art comes from that place. In the beginning, God made all things, and a little while later, not too long ago, somebody put some clay in their mouth, put their hand up against a wall, and spat against the wall. And then they took their hand back from the wall, and they looked at the nothingness where their hand had been. Why? I have no idea. <laughs> but I know it's why I do the same thing. I put my hand where my hand is now not, and I look at what's left. Ink on a page, and emptiness on a page too. It looks back at me, and I'm made and unmade, broken and remade by art. And this, I think, is the impulse towards art. Whether that's a, a song you hum to comfort yourself, whether that's a painting you look at because it brings you a little bit of kindness, whether that's a book you return to, whether that's a poem or a prayer you repeat, it is uh, an assertion of something that speaks to the thing you can't contain by holding you a little bit. The opening words of this text in Hebrew are Bereshe bara lechim, translated in the beginning of God's creating. And you'll hear that the first word there is Bereshit. Um, that's, the, I suppose, we get the translation of the word um, Genesis from that, creating. And it begins with B, as you can hear. And there's a midrash, which is kind of like a psychoanalysis of the text, talking within the text, where the letter A comes before God for 26 generations and is profoundly upset that the letter A was not chosen as the first letter of the first word, of the first sentence, of the first chapter of the first book. 26 generations, the letter A complains before God. Why did you let B have my place? Any parents among here will know very well. Any siblings here will know very well. Any friends here will know very well. Anybody that works with anybody, anybody that knows anybody will know that these rivalries can be powerful. And after 26 generations, God eventually comes up with a plan. And God says to the letter A, okay, listen. I'm about to give them the Ten Commandments. And I'm thinking of maybe starting the Ten Commandments with the letter A. Would that satisfy you? <laughs> and the letter A thinks about it for a while, and the letter A decides that actually people are more likely to recite the Ten Commandments to themselves than they are to recite the opening text of the book of Genesis to themselves. So the letter A thinks people will inhale me more often than they will the letter B. I'll take you up in your offer, God. And God is finally, after 26 generations, able to have a little bit of rest. Not seven days. <laughs> And what I see in that is that even in that extraordinary midrash is you see rivalry between A and B, just like you see rivalry between siblings. The whole way throughout the opening book, you see rivalry between the sisters Rachel and Leah, between the brothers Cain and Abel, between the half-brothers Isaac and Ishmael, between Joseph and his brothers. Also, you see rivalry manufactured between these sisters by law, Sarah and Hagar, or by outlaw, Sarah and Hagar. Over and over and over again, what you see are these pairs that are fighting with each other. And this, too, is a truth that the text tells us, that at the beginning of all things can be a conflict that we can find it hard to know how to contain. And this turns us towards art, too. Abraham had to face the nothing that followed him. He escaped from the fires that his father tried to burn him in, and the nothing has followed him in the face of a fire. When Abraham made the first split offering to God, it was a cauldron of fire that passed between it. God appeared to Abraham as the very fires that he thought were going to consume him. And he says, I am but smoke and ashes when he speaks back to God. God made everything out of nothing, but the nothing follows. These are the calls and the impulses that we recognize at the heart of this profound poem, which is to say there are fundamental things in the human psyche and consciousness that are going to ask for our attention. We've known this since the time of the Genesis poems. In my years of working in conflict resolution, I found myself reflecting on how it is that conflict can sometimes feel um, existential. Sometimes in the face of a death, a family will start to fight amongst themselves because it's easier to fight with your sister than it is to fight with death. At least your sister will react, whereas death just continues on going, not giving a damn. And so it's convenient sometimes, perhaps even comforting, 
to have a fight in the face of us than it is to have something that doesn't seem to pay any attention to us. The poets, the artists behind this poem of Genesis understood some of this magnificence and understood that art, in a certain sense, can try to contain some of that great nothingness. I'm going to read a poem or two. This one's called Make Believe. And on the first day, God made something up. Then everything came along. Seconds, sex, and beasts, and breaths, and rabies. Hunger, healing, lust, and lust's rejections. Swarming things that swarm inside the dirt. Girth, and grind, and grit, and shit, and all shit's functions. Rings inside the tree trunk and branches broken by the snow. Pigs, hearts, and stars. Mystery, suspense, and stingrays. Insects, blood, and interests, and death. Eventually, us, with all our laments, and viruses, and curiosities. All our songs, and stories, and songs about the stories we've forgotten, and all that we've forgotten, we've forgotten. And to hold it all together, God thought up time. But time had other things in mind. Here's another poem about the first fight. The first fight. Afterwards, <clears throat> Adam wandered round naming things. Mountain, he said, covered in sweat from a day's hike. And breeze cooling down. Then earthquake, watching forests fall beneath the earth's shifting plates. God arrived, unnoticed. Avoidance, God said. Adam turned around. Who invited you? Eve sent me, God replied. She's naming all the things that are underneath the earth. Things that will cause the rise and the fall of many other things. Adam sat down and began to cry. Tears, he said, and rage and frustration at all I feel and cannot say and... Shut up, God interrupted. Adam turned around. God had gone away. There's so many things that are true about the poetry of this Genesis, which is the desire for order, the capacity to notice the observation of an ecosystem, the mathematical interest in the number seven, the tension of the something and the nothing. And later on in the second account, we hear the truth of anxiety about knowledge and the body and Eden and desire and the fraught relationship we have with each other and addiction to blame and the relationship of shame to time. These fascinating psychological interests, mathematical, scientific, agricultural, horticultural that are present in this wonderful, wonderful literature. And we hear, too, how isolation is the enemy of integrity in that text. The earliest poem knows something about the human condition. There are other faces of the nothing that you, that you uh, recognize, too, throughout many of the rest of the literatures. Some of the faces of the nothing that we see are the serpent <laughs> and the flame that pursues Abraham, the adversary, Hasatan, that you notice in that, that taunts God in the book of Job perhaps the accuser of the gospel stories too. There's an ex all of these experiences of the nothing call for attention. I'm nearing the end, but here's a small Lenten prayer. It's addressed to Jesus of Nazareth in the Gospel of Mark. In the Gospel of Mark, not much has gone into in terms of the temptation, but it says that Jesus went into the, was led into the wilderness where he was tempted, and he was there with the wild beasts. And I've always thought how interesting it is that the wild beasts are there. So here's a, some words addressed to him. Jesus of the animals. When you faced the nothing, you found friends in unexpected places. Animals with warm hearts and fur, strange tastes and needs and habits. When we are at the end, Meet us in the touch of beasts uninterested in grand designs. Because in your nothingness, you knew what you needed, and you found it in claw and fur 
and teeth and pointed ears. Amen. What we know about this strange order of creation is that we are caught somewhere in the loneliness between the something and the nothing, that our imaginations are rooted in body and extend into what it is we cannot consume, that we are held in this, and that to hold all of this together, we have always had art, the art that holds us and the art that teases us, the art that says something and the art that says something will never be enough to know what the nothing is. In all of this, our deepest impulses toward art, painting, dance, film, music, writing, literature, poetry, whatever your form of art, abstract or concrete, art has always held us together, not by being perfect, but by knowing that in the face of the nothing, the nothingness persists. Padraig will be here at the uh, front of the steps to greet any who would like to stop by. Embracing the creative power of art and language, let us bless the Lord. <laughs>